Thank you for putting up with me for techno with technology, right? Hi guys, how are you doing today? Of course, uh, y'all know me at this point. This is Barbara Drazga, AKA the Deal Diva. You can find me, uh, go to dealdivawholesale.com if you're learning wholesale or doing anything on Amazon with wholesale and beyond. And also join me in my Deal Diva group where we talk everything e-commerce and that's facebook.com slash groups slash Deal Diva. Now that that's out of the way, this is what we are going to be talking about today. I was lucky enough to score JB Brown. Now, if you guys have not heard of JB, hi JB, how are you? Thank you so much hey. for being here today. Hey Barbara, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled that you were able to. Uh, you're just so generous with your your time that you were able to fit fit this fit this in today because uh, I think um, it, this is a topic dear to your heart, and we all know mm. about how important it is right now to identify opportunities in our businesses and other people's businesses so we can help them. So JB, what I know about you is you've got about 15 years experience um, working with Fortune 500 companies and then you moved into entrepreneurship and buying and selling businesses. So you have the business side, the corporate side, as well as the entrepreneurial side. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Barbara. Well, thanks for having me on, first of all. And hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah, I started my career gosh, in the early 2000s and started with corporate America and worked in industries that were diverse. So a lot of time spent in finance, a lot of time spent in um, the medical industry. Those are the two primary. So companies that I've worked with as a consultant, Boston Scientific, Gilead Sciences, Bank of America. So these are, these are large companies. And the things that I would do for them, um, a little bit sort of the behind the scenes guy that they would send in when there was a problem. And that problem could be any number of things. It could be a problem with an enormous client. It could be a logistical problem, just a problem. And I would sort of just try to go in and make it go away. That was my entire job and my entire existence for over a decade. Um, throughout the process of that, I, I ended up getting a lot of um, opportunities to learn and, and develop my own skills. So I became um, an executive coach. I became pretty well versed in financial acquisitions and financial analysis. Um, but the interesting thing was, is as I was solving all of these expensive problems, really, is what they were for large corporations, um, I found a couple things were true. One, um, a professional problem solver, PPS, that's what I've always sort of called myself. Professional problem solver um, is a unique skill set, and it's one that people are willing to pay you very, very for. But... The darndest thing is when you solve enough expensive problems for folks, you can't help if you have some entrepreneurial DNA, but think, to, wait a minute, I could continue to solve these problems for Fortune 500 companies and make X and be under their control, have my family be sort of under their control, or I could use that same skill set and sort of take them up and go do it for myself. And um, so probably about six years ago, I started doing that and I got into um, more of an entrepreneurial type of endeavor, started buying and selling different types of businesses. So mm -hmm. I've bought and sold everything from franchises to e-commerce based businesses to brick and mortar businesses. And um, I also am a member of the IBBA, which is a business brokerage organization. So I've also helped other folks buy and sell businesses. So it's become a passion of mine. It's something that I'm, um, I'm very interested in. And right now there are some interesting dynamics as Barbara and I talked about sort of before this, you already had what um, the Pew Research Center has called a tsunami coming, okay? That's their term, not mine. So a business sales tsunami. Why? Because we have a massive, massive number of uh, certain demographic that's getting close to being ready to exit business. Baby boomers is what we're talking about. So we already had this enormous um, glut of folks that between sometime between now and really the next so, and everything in between are going to be looking to exit every type of business you can imagine. And so that was already an enormous sea change in situation that was ready to happen. And I was gearing up in my business and also a lot of my colleagues and friends would call me for advice and say, JB, how do we, how do I grow my business now in a year in five years, et cetera. And I always would tell them one, obviously focus on what you're doing, but two, don't be afraid consider growing via acquisition because there would be some incredible deals on incredible business. So there's that by itself. Then we have this situation that we all find ourselves in where most of us are sitting at home and we have coronavirus. Um, 
it would be easy to think to yourself as a business person, oh no, coronavirus um, has us all sheltering in place, the economy is going to collapse, um, it's a bad time to buy businesses. I think that's wrong. I think that really does is it accelerates the timeline that you may be able to, um, you have to be brought, smart about it, but you may be able to acquire a phenomenal deal and a, and a phenomenal business for yourself. Now, not every business is going to survive, candidly, depending upon the industry that folks are in. Um, there will be some of those baby boomers that just have really bad luck and never recover. But there's there will also be a number of them that the business is in a vertical where it'll survive anyway. Um, and think about unsexy businesses. Um, if you talk to me enough, you'll hear me use that phrase a lot. I love unsexy businesses. What is that? To me, it's, a, it's just a boring business that stood the test of time, that has really solid financials. It's simple. It's to understand how it runs. It doesn't necessarily matter to me the nature of the industry that the business is in, but um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So I recently vetted a garbage disposal business, not garbage disposals in the sink, but literally a small business where in a fairly rural area, there's like eight garbage trucks and these folks drive around and they pick up trash from people's driveways. Pretty straightforward business, phenomenal numbers. Um, this gentleman had children that had absolutely no interest in being in the garbage business, which is happening a lot with baby boomers. They have that just don't have the same desire to be involved in the family business. That's happening a lot. Maybe they don't have the stomach for it. Maybe they don't have the skills. Um, maybe garbage isn't their thing in this, in this instance. So um, phenomenal business. The, the about $1.2 million in gross revenue um, for this particular endeavor and 40% margins, which are phenomenal in that business. And, you know, there's a number of different plays that you could go with a business like that. Similarly, um, businesses that are, healthcare service based. So think um, people are home and they're invalid for any number of reasons and they need um, perhaps non-degreed medical personnel to come to their home and just take care of them, help them get better, help them rehabilitate, whatever it is. Those are phenomenous, phenomenal um, cash flowing businesses that most of which right now are owners. So um, those aren't going anywhere because interestingly, that same population is going to self feed demand for that service. So these are businesses that are going to stay around. They'll go through a valley like everybody's been now, um, not everybody, but most, and they will create a scenario where some of those owners are going to look at their business and say, okay, I was going to sell this in three, four, five years. Anyway, <sighs> if I could find the right, person to acquire it, energetic or just energetic, um, I don't maybe have the stomach for this anymore. You know, maybe I'm looking at what could be a three, six, 12 month protracted recovery or longer. <sighs> I'll just cash in my chips and take what I can get at the moment. There'll be a lot of that sentiment. So if you can be a solution, for any of these business owners. And there's a lot of creative ways that we can get into, Barbara, where you can make that happen um, with or without capital. Um, E-com sellers as well, in particular, there'll be, I think, some unique opportunities that, that were not there before. So ultimately, what I'm getting at and what I'm counseling, everyone that I know who asks my advice is, is be open for business. And I, I don't mean, I mean literally your own business, but I mean just be open to thinking about the idea that this might be a great time for you to acquire a business that you maybe didn't think about before. Thank you. Um, so I acquired my first set of business asset assets in January with the goal of acquiring every quarter, acquiring a, another business or the assets of another business. And I have been uh -huh. on, um, there was a pet store that is going out of business chain of pet stores and they've put their digital assets up for sale and uh, the close date, because they're in, um, you know, they're in a bankruptcy proceeding that takes a little longer, end of May, but sure. I'm on it. I'm on it. Uh, also, they're trademarks. So. And quick point, Barbara, I want to hear the rest of your story, but I want the folks to understand. Barbara just glossed over a really important nuance that she understands, but maybe not all of you will. There is a difference between a business acquisition and an asset sale. So an asset sales, what Barbara's doing is a phenomenal strategy right now where there's a lot of businesses that are just going to go out of business. Maybe they have some debt that you really wouldn't want to acquire with them. So you, you don't necessarily, so let's say they're held in a, um, a C corporation, for example, just to keep it kind of clean and they have shares in the corporation. Well, one way to acquire businesses that you could actually 
acquire the business, buy the shares, and you acquire the whole kit and caboodle associated with the business. So you acquire the goodwill, the intangible assets, the tangible assets. So um, any stock that they have, inventory, trademarks, all that is negotiable. Sometimes there's real estate involved, sometimes there's not. That is a true acquisition and you're buying out 100% of the shares from whomever owns that entity. What Barbara's talking about is a different approach that's a little simpler because it's a very straightforward where you're just essentially bidding on the actual assets that the company has, which could be digital assets. So it could be website, social media, goodwill, et cetera, or it could be inventory. So if it's a, especially in retail, a lot of times you see asset sales because a business will get itself in trouble with debt and they can't really get out of it. So you don't really want to acquire their debt. That's not a good solution for you, but you definitely can acquire some of their assets at a, you know, 20% discount. So, yeah. So you, you, to, you started to do your due diligence on your business, which due diligence for those who don't know, just like real estate, it's okay, this is interesting to me. Let me, let me start turning over rocks and look a little bit further into this business. So what did you, when you looked into it? So they, uh, it, it's a brick and mortar store that went out of business and they started selling all the physical products off last September, according to the Facebook page. And I kind of looked at um, the history mm. of the ads they were doing but they, uh, they have this um, email list of subscribers to, Ooh. yes, 5,990 of them. I know the number exactly. Emails of people who subscribed to their, their pet, um, I think it was a paid subscription. Oh, okay. Makes it even more appealing. Plus the trademarks and the domain names. But I registered a domain name that um, had the word like, uh, it was like, you know, pet clubster. Right, had it was similar to it, but to mimic that, there's a continuity mm -hmm. in their subscription yep. program too. But here's here's what I heard in what you just said um, earlier was uh, that you like non-sexy businesses. I agree. Yep. Uh, the difference is, and it's just because I'm not as sophisticated as you, is that I'm looking for business and business assets that are related to other assets I have, so Love that it. I can cross pollinate. I can put them together. I can be sleek. Um, streamline. I know exactly. I know what my skill set is. So if it's marketing and email marketing uh, and um, uh, uh, conversion, then I'm just going to hyper focus on that. Buying a, a big company with all those moving parts you just mentioned would take a lot longer for me to leverage money out of that mm. acquisition. So as a small acquirer, yeah. I'm being hyper targeted. Like I know nothing about the um the trash business mm -hmm. so i could probably go in there and tweak the marketing of it um you know maybe flip it for a little bit of extra money by doing um by increase you know increasing the marketing system social media whatever but i can't mix it with other assets i have and the reason i'm choosing the pet market the baby market right now mm -hmm. is because a lot more people are adopting pets I just heard a story yesterday. And there's about to be a whole lot more babies in about nine months. In nine months. Exactly. <laughs> Eight, nine months, there's going to be a baby boom. Uh, I have a baby brand already of baby blankets. Um, mm. But And yesterday I learned that pet stores, didn't occur to me, are practically giving away the animals that they would normally sell. I would never advocate, this is just me, buying yeah. an animal at a pet store until Thanks. now. Yeah, I agree with that. Those animals, and the stores are shut. So as are all of the assets sitting in the store. Mm -hmm. All the physical products sitting in the stores. So I would do pet and baby because I can, I have other assets I can cross pollinate with. So what you're talking about is a roll up, essentially. That's she, she's Barbara's. It's a phenomenal strategy. It's what do I already know? What are the efficiencies that I have in my business? What do we, if it's more than one person in your entity, what do we do well? And then how can we now? So you can acquire um, businesses that you could easily fit into what you're doing. So if you're in a retail e-commerce business, just it's really just additional product lines that make sense for you. Another way to do the exact same thing is what I would call a raw material or supply chain roll-up. So you could, let's say for example, uh, so if Barbara is making baby clothes, um, hypothetically, and she had the opportunity to acquire a factory that specialized in Pima cotton material that was make, used to make those and they were already selling other things and she could get it at an incredible discount, it might make sense for her to consider what I would call a raw supply chain acquisition because it's just going to feed what she's already doing with additional products that she could have made and it would probably make a little bit easier for her the ability to um, fully control her supply chain, what we would call vertical, vertically integrated. Now, here's... I, I, 
I dumbed that down even further. Again, not knowing everything that you know, I'm just sort of sometimes yeah. in the dark and get lucky. So I contacted a factory that are, I, I purchased baby blankets wholesale that were liquidation. Then mm. I in touch with the factory and I went to the factory and I bought out the extra fabric they had that had designs in niche markets. Did I lose you? You froze up there. So I didn't, I didn't buy the factory. I bought out the extra fabric that they had that was sitting around that met my criteria for niche markets. So it looks like you froze up there, JB. So JB, oh, there you go, you're back. So you bought out the extra fabric, that's brilliant. It's, um, I love your strategy because it's a very, and I don't, I'm about to say this word and this is a great word. Some people think that I, you say this word, it's a negative connotation, but in business it's great. You're an opportunist, which I think is a phenomenal way to go about looking at how to improve your leverage position in an asset. Um, I want to go back though to your digital asset acquisition with the pet store because the one question that, because I did this once before and I made a mistake. And I didn't even know that I was making a mistake when I did it. And it wasn't until it was, a, I'll tell you what it was. It was a, um, it was a, a set of yoga based jewelry, which I didn't at the time know was a thing, but they had some pretty good numbers and I had some interest in acquiring them. Uh, and they had a, let's see, they had about a 55,000 person email list and they had um, a Facebook page that had, I want to say, almost a quarter of a million followers. So it sounds awesome in theory, right? Here's what I didn't know. And, and this is where as a leader in your business, sometimes you just, <laughs> you just sort of take shots and you learn as you go. I didn't even think to ask about cookies, um, stickiness, um, engagement rate. So how recently had um, that list or the Facebook group been engaged with? I didn't even know to think that. I had no idea that that would matter. And so what, what it turned out was happening, and we didn't pay a lot of money for it, so it wasn't that big of a deal, but what it turned out was happening was these folks had run sort of a drop ship type promotion, and it was a very finite period of time, and they had, um, uh, they had sort of sticky cookies attached to folks, but we didn't, we didn't get those in the transfer. So we didn't have the ability to directly retarget any of those people. And at the time, of course, I know that now lesson learned, but we didn't even know to, we didn't even think to, to know that. And with the email list, it only had about a, about a quarter of a percent open rate, which I wouldn't at, the, at that time, and this is years ago, but at that time I wouldn't even have known that was bad. <laughs> so I was thinking, well, you know, math, that's not so bad. So did you, did, did, were they able to give you some of their metrics for their engagement? No, because we can't uh, talk directly to the company. I actually tried calling uh, the phone number on the, uh, and then I even texted the phone number. But here's here's um, the process I have in the back end when I acquire email lists assets, for example. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we do is we, we, we scrub them. We use a scrub service, scrub them out, take off all the dead ones, yep. and then we have a warm up period where we do uh, we we put them through a. Uh, a lead page for you know just give them something for free in order to get them opted in and we do it in a very um soft way right we don't hit them with sales or anything and then we so look you're like rewarming them almost rewarming them up right and then getting them used to saying yes in, in like micro that. commitments okay like that. and then the other thing that i do is this particular brand that has a facebook page thank you i forgot about that has like 50,000, 40,000 uh, likes. Mm. So what I can do is upload those emails and then do a, a, a lookalike audience ad, right? And kind of build yep. that, target that page exactly. So I've already got a process for when I acquire an email list. And that's what I know. So for me to acquire a business that does garbage collection, I wouldn't be able to like, uh, you know, click on a process because I've never done that before. So what do you recommend yep. to people who yep. uh, maybe have never acquired a business assets or acquired a business? How would you get started in retail? Yeah. Whatever. So there's a couple of sites that I can recommend. I, I want to get back to that garbage thing just one more second because here's where I think folks get, uh, they get a little bit overwhelmed and they get intimidated by this idea. At the end of the day, everybody's played Monopoly. Everybody. And as a kid, this is weird, but as a kid, that was my favorite game to play. I loved playing Monopoly. And I would do all these wonky creative things in the middle of the game. When it came to my turn, I'd be trying to negotiate things. And this is just who I am. That's who I've always been. So 
ultimately with businesses to me, and this is, this is my, you know, JB's worldview as it is of business acquisition within reason, I don't care what the business is. What I care about is, can I understand it enough quickly to figure out how to make a profitable maneuver and then get out? So with the garbage business, uh, it didn't take me very long to figure out, it took me about an hour of research to figure out that the real play with something like that is um, what I call the nuisance play. The nuisance play, and this actually works in e-commerce as well, by the way. Um, the nuisance play is you acquire an asset that's undervalued. You then take that asset and you leverage it to go take business from a much bigger competitor and a much bigger asset. And you do that in a way that you do it quickly enough. And even if you have to do it at a little bit of a loss for a little bit, you just tick them off because they're going to notice like, wait a second, who is this that we never had to worry about this little tiny competitor. Now, all of a sudden they're eating into our market share. Who is this? So in many cases, what will happen is they will offer to buy you out to make you go away. Yeah. No, so in that case, I, that nuisance play, I love that you call it something. That's really cool. The nuisance play. The yeah. And I made that up. It's not an official term, but yeah. The first thing I was thinking when you uh, said the, you know, the trash business, I'm like, we'll just add some value to it and then flip it to Wayne Huizenga. That's it. Oh, and all you're doing. And, and I thought was, let me just get in, make some extra money and get out. <laughs> literally the play there is this it's, I would hire two extremely, so this is a defined geography in this particular business. I'd hire, they had no sales reps. I'd hire two aggressive sales reps, pay them on commission, have them go sign up heavy, heavy sign up accounts of the competitor for six, 12 months. And I have a suspicion that at six and 12 months, I could then approach the competitor and say, listen, I'll sell it to you for this. And I'd probably sell it to him for two times what I paid. That would be, that would be the play. And, and now in this case, there were some, there were some problems that I had with the business I did not like. So if you're new and you've never bought a business and you don't have a, um, what I would call a generalist's business background, which is, that's me. So I have a very general business background. I've led marketing teams. I've led R and D teams. I've led finance. Um, so I have the ability to look at different sectors of a business. Now, here's the thing. The only thing that I'm level 10 ninja, I can tell by talking to Barbara that when it comes to email lists and digital marketing, that's her thing. And Barbara is somebody that I would engage to do something for me because what I ultimately am is a CEO, really. That's the way my brain works. So I'm very good at big picture and I'm an, I'm an unusually good negotiator. Those are really the two skills I have. All the other things, I don't really worry about knowing. I just worry about knowing enough. I just have to know enough to generally understand what's happening and understand kind of what the business does, who the customers are, what the upside is for the business. And if I can do that, as long as it's not a very complex business, this is why I remember earlier, I said we like unsexy businesses, because when you start getting into businesses that have 50 moving parts, I'm not even interested in that because there's just too much. So businesses that I really don't like are heavily regulated businesses. So you can technically, Barbara or me or anybody in, in many states in the country, you cannot own, for example, a medical practice if you are not a physician. Um, so there is a way to go about it such that you can create a holding company that runs the operations of the medical practice. So it's a nuance that you can do. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. My little dog's barking. It um, like a duck. <laughs> no, he's, he's, he's a little rescue dog that we got about four months ago. And he, he tries to be respectful when he, he knows when I'm on uh, a call. And so he does this weird little quiet bark instead. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Yeah. So, but the medical business obviously is, ex it's, it's, I know the business well, but even then, there's a lot of liability involved. There are a lot of regulations as to what you can do, when you can do it, how you can do it. That's a business that would make me very, very nervous that I wouldn't even touch. Flip side is if I'm an e-commerce, which I have a suspicion that a lot of the folks here on this call are in either some form of e-commerce or digital marketing or something that relates to one of those things. This is a fantastic time to start looking at businesses that are did well, before this happened. So there's a, there's two lists that I looked at this morning and they were both top 100 lists. And what I'll do, Barb, is I'll shoot them over. Barbara, I'm sorry. You don't like Barb. Um, I will shoot them over to you and folks can look at them. But it was interesting to me because it was the 100 fastest growing products in um, sort of online buying. And it was the fastest declining 100 products in online buying. And it's interesting. A lot of it was things that you really would expect to see. So for example, the fastest growing product uh, right now is disposable gloves. That's, that's over, not surprising. Over what time frame? Over the last month. So it's a 30 day okay. snapshot. Okay. So 30 day snapshot, month over month, you're talking about 600 
I don't know, 650 and change, 650 and change percent. That isn't a surprise to me. So what I like to see is, can I look at data and have a pretty good understanding of why the data is the way that it is? That's what I'm looking for. So I can clearly understand why disposable gloves are up. You guys, we can all understand why personal protective equipment, PPE, is up through the roof. What I look for, though, is anomalies that don't make sense initially on their face, because then I want to understand the why behind it, and that might give me some actionable intelligence that I can then use to make a decision. So guess what number three was on that list, Barbara? Cameras. Oh, yeah. On the declining list, not the, the uh, I'm sorry, not the growing list. Really? On the declining list, cameras. And at first, I'm looking at it going, what? This, I, don't, I don't understand. And then it actually, this particular service was nice enough to put a little, because they knew everybody would look at cameras and say, why are cameras down? And it was one of the few things that they put a little um, explanation in. Think about everything that's getting canceled right now that we can't do. Weddings, Weddings. sporting events, activities, graduations. Conference. What do you need a camera for? Crazy. Conferences, yeah. yeah. You don't need a camera if you're not going to those things. So camera um, sales is down 70% right now. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, as an example, all right, camera sales are down right now, but do I believe this is a permanent trend, a permanent situation, or do I believe that this is a temporary situation brought on by external factors? Clearly to me, this is an external factor situation and people are going to begin buying cameras again. We don't know when, that's the, that's the challenge. Nobody knows when, but this could be a good time. There are a lot of businesses that uh, are online, Amazon in particular. So there could be a lot of Amazon or Shopify businesses that specialize in selling what I would term photography accessories. Well, if you're not buying cameras, you're probably also not buying the light pole kits. You're not buying um, the lights. You're not buying um, the little handheld things that you stick the camera on. There's a lot of accessories to cameras that are also tanking. So the sellers of those products, depending upon how well capitalized they were and if they were diversified across their business, maybe they can weather the storm. Maybe they can't. And if they can't, and this is where earlier when I said, I don't think that being a little bit opportunistic is necessarily a bad thing. I know this could be a great time to look at anything related to camera accessories because they're about to take a beating for a few months. The yeah, revenue just, numbers are going to be sparked down. an idea I want to share with you guys. So as he's talking, my brain processes stuff. Uh, and what I was, what I came up with was container auctions. So the, the course of events has been, we went from in China, New Year's, Chinese New Year's, and then directly into the factories not being able to reopen. And yep. now a lot of people who had maybe private label products sitting there in factory, they already paid for it. It will eventually show up in the States, hit the ports, and these folks are out of money. What if it's camera accessories? Absolutely. Now you've got that container sitting there that they're paying um, uh, a storage for at the port. Mm -hmm. They need something out of. So mm -hmm. I'm going to look into container auctions. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, and, and not just cameras. So if you look at that same list, what I'm doing just as a big picture thing for folks to be a, an actionable tip that you could implement right now, even if you didn't necessarily want to acquire a, a fully functioning business. So a guy like me, I'm looking, I don't really have a, a, a high number in mind because I know so many creative ways to acquire businesses. So if there's a $10 million business for sale and it's a phenomenal business, and I like it, and I think I could run it well and put people in place to subject matter experts to run it for me, I'm going to take my shot and I'll put finance together to do it. But I know that not everybody really has that desire. So in e-commerce, I'm also doing the same thing you are, Barbara. So there's enormous examples. So I look at that, I look at that list of 100 products that are tanking, and I start highlighting. And I start doing just some basic high-level logic and then I do some Google trend keyword research. And then again, you just using your brain to look at it and say, okay, here are some products that I think may have outlived their usefulness and they probably won't come back in general. But then another one that was down significantly was camping products. Well, of course they were down because nobody can go anywhere. So outdoor products, outdoor accessories, sporting products, what's going to happen? I have three children. Okay. They're eight, six, and four. Two of them are athletes. All of them are activity freaks. These kids, the moment that we're allowed to leave our house, are going to be wanting to do anything that has to do with sports or being outdoors. So same thing. A lot of those products that are sitting there in containers that folks probably have run out of cash to be able to do anything with, because let's be honest, there's a lot of folks in e-commerce that candidly over leverage themselves. When I say over leverage, what I mean is they use a little bit too much debt. Uh, I used to do a lot of e-commerce coaching for Amazon, and the reason I got out of it was because there were so many folks that had already spoken to a guru 
and the guru told them to put $50,000 worth of merchandise on a credit card and you know sell it private label and everything would be fine that you know barbara and i know and some of you know it's just not that easy you really you have to know what you're doing you can make money but it's you can't just slap up listings and hope for the best so those are folks that right now yes they're they're probably getting a little bit of relief from chase or american express or whomever it is but that's not going to go on forever eventually those bills are going to come due and they don't have the ability to even send those products in if they wanted to right now because most of them are non-essential. So you're looking for non-essential products that you know long-term are still going to be great products, even if it's next summer. Because right now, summer, it might be a little late, but those products that would have done well this summer, they'll be fine next summer. And I, I would challenge that too late thing because yeah. a lot of people are home. I live in Arizona. People with heated pools are out there in their heated pools. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, um, and there was a, a gentleman that I, I consulted with who has a product that is a travel product, right? For kids, like this, this little, um, this little travel thing where they can color on it, whatever. And his sales went away and he was mm. terrified he's going out of business. So we just talked and said, all right, right now, what's the hot market is kids are home. People are yeah. homeschooling. How do we not make that a travel item anymore? And we turn it into a, um, an activity, um, set for kids. So just switching the target market of something like sporting equipment, okay, that's if they're going out and playing sports, but yep. what if you put together kits of stay-at-home sporting, you know, a mini soccer kit where they could play um, out in the backyard. And then well, and you know what? Switch your, you make a really great point, and there's another add-on to it, which is if you're an Amazon seller or, you know, whatever you were, whatever we're no your primary. We're longer calling ourselves Amazon sellers, by the way, you guys know, I've been talking about this for 18 months. You were e-commerce sellers and Amazon yes. is a platform. And today, that. this situation has been on steroids, a, a, a little bit of a reckoning with having to force folks to start thinking that way. So to your point, just because you can't send a pallet of something into Amazon right now does not mean you can't sell it. It just means you have to adapt a little bit. So I'll give you some specific examples. I've spent the last, I don't know, two months. And I, interestingly, I had already done this for different reasons, but it, it intensified when this happened. I had spent the last two months learning about different ways to have a more direct relationship with consumers to build my own list. So one of the softwares that I use, and it really doesn't matter the software, just this is the most well-known one. I spent a lot of time trying to get to understand ClickFunnels better and specifically selling products within ClickFunnels. And it, it, it allows you to, once you've built a list, you actually can build a list, but once you build a list, it allows you a fairly simple way to engage with a customer, get them through a buying experience that you control. And then at the end of that, you know, you have your cart purchase and the, the caveat is you have to be willing to either fulfill the item yourself or there's plenty of great third party fulfillment yeah. centers that are doing great right now. Yeah. So you just, um, a lot of folks, and to your point, Barbara, I can't tell you how many conversations that I've had with folks that like right now I'm not even charging people for consulting because it's just sort of one yeah. of those things. I feel like we so can, I agree completely. There, there'll be a time for that. And I think yeah. folks will remember, but even some big companies that have called and said, we don't know what to do. And I'm like, all right, let's just walk through this together. And one of the things that I'm really trying to hammer home to folks is there's going to be phenomenal opportunity here. Some folks are going to come out of this better off than they were before. And they will be the folks who are willing to really just critically think through the problem, try to be a bit stoic, you know, if you forgive the term stoicism and just look at the problem and try to identify it and try to solve it. And yes, right now, Amazon is a bit of a challenge to say the least, if you're not selling flour bandages, you know, <laughs> protective equipment and toilet paper, but that doesn't mean that you can't still um, do well. It just means that you're going to have to do some of the things that folks were doing before Amazon came around, which is directly engage with your consumer. You can sell on eBay. If you want to set up a simple Shopify store, you can Facebook marketplace. If you're doing liquidation, if you buy a container, I live in North Atlanta. I've got in my backyard, 1.6 million buyers who could buy a lot of things. So just be a little bit more creative. Um, and looking for these opportunities. I think we've been a little bit lazy as Amazon sellers, not I have. for yep. other things, you know? So I, I want to um, come back around to an idea I had. I've, I've got notes here. I'm not ignoring you. I'm just frantically making notes on yep. the sporting market and opportunity in the sporting goods market. So you mentioned you have three boys, two of them are athletic and they probably, you know, they're when, when we're back to whatever the new normal is. One boy, two girls. The girls will get mad if I didn't correct that. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. So you've got like, 
athletic kids. I do. They're out playing soccer and football. What mm -hmm. do they need? Drop it in the chat, guys. I want to see that you're interacting mm. here. They're out playing with a team of kids and they're all looking the same, right? Where yeah. am I going here? What is the opportunity now? Companies that have equipment that make what yeah. that the kids now can't wear. I'm giving it away here. So printing companies that make the jerseys, the uniforms, doors are shuttered. Yep. These, a lot of them are not our mom and pop businesses. I'm getting excited about this because now I'm going to go find some, right? Mom and pop <laughs> businesses. And they have a couple of those silk printing machines, whatever they're called, right? Sure. You could snap up that equipment, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, and all of that inventory and their clients that are not playing team sports right now, but they will be. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity. You're exactly right. I agree. Uh, if, you, if you're a buy and hold, so we can get a little bit into the weeds here, but there's, yeah. there's to me, um, there's, different, there's, there's, there's not really a right and a wrong way to be a good business investor, a good business person. For me, being a business investor means that I'm pretty flexible. So I'll buy an entire enterprise or like Barbara, if I see an opportunity and there's three containers of a product that I know I can make 40% margins on by simply buying that inventory and holding it for 12 months, I'll do it. So a good buy and hold opportunity right now, baseball season's over. We missed it. We just missed it for kids, not for professionals. They'll probably move it and we'll be seeing the world series in December, but for kids, baseball season's over. Have y'all ever looked at what baseball, I, I have kids, so I know this and we're a baseball family. You ever looked at what baseball equipment actually costs? You know how much an average um, mid range to high end T-ball age baseball bat costs? It's about 160 bucks retail. So if you get one of those, and you can buy an entire lot of those and maybe some gloves, the balls themselves, baseballs, those are four or five bucks a pop. So if you can get those at a 60, 70% discount and just wait a year, now not everybody's in a position to do that, but don't just think baseball. That's just the example I gave. Anything that we may have just missed the season. So Barbara's example earlier was a great tactical one. Think about summer things that you can still sell by selling it direct to consumer. Yes. Also, think about things that we might have just missed. Just it is what it is. We've missed it. There are going to be a, there's going to be a glut of merchandise that's going to be perfectly good for the the next annual of the season. Easter. Easter is a great one. You walk into a retail store, you've got empty rows of toilet paper and soda pop, and the seasonal is stacked up. No yeah. Fine Easter. And boy, I was just thinking the other day, Barbara, because my wife and I were trying to solve for our own Easter woes because we're not leaving. And we're, everyone's in a different spot across the country, I think, although I think we're all getting pretty close to being in the same situation. But for us, and I'm in Gwinnett County, Georgia, so it's the largest sort of county right above Atlanta. And we have been asked to shelter in place. Like we're not really supposed to leave at all. Some people are doing that. Some people are not. But that's what they've asked us to do. So for us, we're trying to really be responsible and do our part to, you know, flatten this curve, as they say. And so, but we have Easter coming. We have three kids. I'm like, oh, sugar, what do we do? So I had to get really creative and trying to figure out how can I compile items to put into an Easter basket. But I was thinking to myself, if I had been a little quicker on the uptake, um, because we did do some bulk shopping. We didn't hoard, but we did do some bulk shopping about two weeks ago. And if I had thought this through, and if I was thinking about things other than milk and eggs, I would have realized, oh, Easter's coming. Let me buy everything that Walmart has. <laughs> and I would have put together baskets and I no, would have slapped a, a landing page. I would have slapped You're up just, and just boom. Just the baskets. You just buy their done for you baskets that are stocked up. That's a great point. Yep. There's and then baskets, sell them. There's baskets with soccer balls in them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to take that further, right now is the time well, I don't want us to look back three weeks from now saying, I wish three weeks ago I would have bought this mm -hmm. yeah. for Mother's Day, for example. Mother's Day, Father's Day, yeah. Fourth of July. Mother's too. Day, Father's Day, Fourth of July picnics, right? So yep. think about what those opportunity opportunities are to pull the trigger on now to take mm -hmm. short-term advantage of those trends. I, I, I did write one more question down that I, I wanted to make sure I got asked for you because this is just so much fun brainstorming. With sure. You, my sort of hijack. Um, Service business versus physical product business yep. versus digital product business. Yep. Usually, um, 
different margins, obviously. I love all of them for different reasons. So physical products business, it depends on what it is. The greatest opportunity in physical products, I believe, between now and you know four or five years from now, is some variation of what folks consider a day-to-day -day product. That doesn't necessarily mean it's essential like Amazon is defining it. So, you know, toilet paper, wipes, et cetera. But it could be just something simple because what's about to happen? A lot of folks started working from home sort of by necessity. A fair number of those folks stand to reason are going to continue doing that yep. because I think some companies are going to realize, oh, actually, this didn't, this wasn't that bad. We say we don't even really need this big office facility. Let's move some of these folks who want to back home. I agree. So, so some of these folks are going to need supplies they never had before. So they're going to need things for a home office setup. They're going to need everything that would allow them to work. They're going to need creature comforts at home that maybe they were getting free coffee where they worked and in a home, they don't have that. So there'll be a lot of things, I think, from a physical office product. Supplies. Yeah, yeah, office supplies, uh, desks for, not, not a desk, but you know, the thing that you set on your bed that you sit your laptop on, those mm -hmm. are going to skyrocket. So there'll be a lot of, I think, physical product things. Food items are interesting. I love the idea of some of these subscription boxes because again, when consumer behavior, so if Pandora's box opens and consumer behavior starts to change and it changes for long enough, that builds a habit. So what are we getting used to right now? I think what we've really done is accelerated drastically the curve of folks who are getting used to ordering their food online. We didn't yeah, do that before. Come to us now. We don't go, I got to run to the grocery store for eggs. No, nope, just yeah. the button. It changed for me. I'll tell you, uh, and I'll, give them, I'll give this company a free shout out. I, I don't care because they're doing an amazing job with their marketing. It's, uh, it's called Wild Alaskan. Ooh. And this came about because what we were doing was we, were, we had got a bunch of meat at the grocery store. And I also have a local farmer that we buy like shares of a cow from because we try to be as local as we can. But it's a lot of beef and it's a lot of red meat. And my kids are not the biggest chicken fans but they will eat fish. And so I'm thinking we live in freaking landlocked Atlanta. What am I going to do? I'm from Maine, by the way. So it's even harder, but we live here. And then I just happened to, it's almost like I, you know, the old thing where you say something out loud and Facebook hears you or Google. And the next thing you know, <laughs> you see an ad. Well, that happened. And it was a company called wild Alaskan and they flash freeze wild caught Alaskan seafood. A lot of it is salmon. Some of it is white fish wow. and they will dry ice ship it right now today. They'll ship it every month to your door. And so I grabbed a subscription. I think it was a hundred bucks and you know, it ends up being about $9 per filet, which is not unreasonable. And I don't think I'll cancel it when this is over because I'm, we're getting used to not having to go deal with. So now our protein sources are kind of taken care of. So food is an example where um, it, maybe it's not going to be fresh food, but what if it's uh, the ability to source um, superfood powders for people's coffee because folks are a little dairy hesitant, or maybe it's any kind of variation of food or of flavoring or whatever it is that you can think of. So physical product opportunities will be there. The margins um, tend to be, well, you know, anywhere from 10 to 25, maybe 30%. 30% is good. If you're selling physical products and you have 30% margins, you're doing really well. Um, service-based businesses I love, especially service-based businesses that cater to growing powerful demographics. So again, we're going back to the baby boomers and what's about to happen in their life cycle. So the life cycle of baby boomers in the next 15 years is going to change pretty drastically. So if you just think to yourself, okay, so maybe they exit a business and they start to travel a little bit. Some of them, maybe they start to do some, um, they pick up some hobbies that they didn't have before. So hobby based things for that age demographic could be a, niche, uh, a good niche to be in service. So experiences is kind of what I'm getting at services. So a lot of these folks are probably going to encounter a situation where they may have to increase how many prescriptions they're taking. So prescription delivery, personal assistant type services, lawn care, those types of things. And these, uh, especially if you're around a community where there are a lot of retirees, we have, I don't really know what you call them actually, but we probably have 15 of these um, they're okay. popping up everywhere. They're, they're retired. They're communities that are specifically built for 55 plus people. I guess that's what you call it. 55 plus communities. Communities. Yeah, 55. yeah. And they're very fancy. They have a lot of amenities, but if you can cater to um, services or acquire a business that is catering to services, especially if it's a business that is a service-based business and they have not yet 
got into that demographic. So for me, if I'm here and I know that there's a local company that does um, pool cleaning, pizza delivery, whatever, any of those things, um, personal concierge type services, and their existing clientele has been mostly corporate or families my age. So someone who's 40 years old has a couple of young kids and they really haven't done anything with baby boomers. And I know that there's four 55 plus communities that are popping up because I know the zoning committee and it's popping up in the next two years. I want to get that business right now today because I want to get it before they start to realize the increase in revenue from those additional services. Well, not only that, but those communities, potentially you're not selling to the individual homeowners. You're selling to the HOA. So 100%. it's one sale for a big contract. Yeah. And it's a contract. That's exactly right. It's a contract based service agreement that you're willing to give a, probably a slightly discounted rate, maybe even a, a significantly discounted rate for whatever services that you're providing compared to what you maybe would have charged someone individually, but you don't care because the sheer volume that you're going to make up, it's the same thing as being willing to sell something a little bit less on Amazon than you might somewhere else, because you know, you're going to sell 10 X the volume on Amazon that you might over here. So it's the same idea. So service-based businesses, I like pets. Pets is a big one. So service-based businesses were pets. So mobile grooming, um, DIY grooming, full service grooming, um, uh, dog walking, those types of things. Anything to do with pets uh, is going to be a really good business to be in if it's a service-based approach in the coming years, because there's a lot of folks that either did not ever have kids and their pets are their kids, or their kids are long gone and they have their own families and they still have these pets and, you know, the pets are their family. So, um, That's we, yeah, it's Barbara. So, you know, no, certainly no, the Barbara's an animal lover. So it's, it, pet is a great space to be in. But well, um, when I travel... I'm, I'm blessed that I have a friend of mine who comes and lives at the house and takes care of my mm. babies and they adore him. And, you know, he's like Uncle JD, but not everybody has that. You need pets, oh. right? And we're leery. So my mother is 62. Yeah, she's 62. Um, and she lives with us. So we, we have a sort of a walkout basement and the whole thing is full and it's oh. daylight and everything. And so she lives with us and she has a rescue dog as well. We have three dogs two upstairs, one down. And hers is a rescue pit bull lab mix. And that dog is her child. Like, I think she loves the dog more than me. In fact, I know she does. Uh, and I'm okay with that. So she, we talk about going on vacations. And of course, we would love for her to go with us. But she is so particular and concerned about hiring. A, she, the idea of boarding the dog is that's a non-starter. She's not putting the dog in a kennel, not happening. Yeah. So the idea, but, and then even, you know, having someone come to the house, there's such concern, like who, who, who how do I know? So if you had the opportunity to either start or acquire um, a service that had phenomenal reputation, great reviews, you know, vetted providers. Background that would, check. Background check, because oh. most don't do that. You know, how, and that's another thing. How can you value add? So when you're looking to acquire, whether it's an asset or a business, you really ought to be thinking, just like flipping a house. Like, how am I going to add value to this that wasn't there before? And it could be something that you know with your own skill set, Barbara, like you said, with knowing how to handle intake of email lists and et cetera. Or for somebody like me, it's I I know that if I tweak this, this, and this, and if I bring this person in and if I do this, I'm gonna add value to the business because, like you said, if it's if it's a business that has never done background checks and and I look around and there's 20 pet sitting businesses in 10 zip codes around me and zero of them advertise. Maybe they do it, but they don't advertise that they do background checks. First thing I'm doing is I'm doing background checks and I'm putting it prominently on my website. All of our employees are fully background checked and bonded. So that means that if they do something wrong, we're going to cover it financially for you because that's an yeah, enormous a marketing play for that could be that um, they hold a one time a week doggy play date. Yeah. Where they invite owners to come to a dog park and come meet us and see how that person interacts with the dogs. And they could just do that as a free, um, basically lead generation. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a, so, so in general, service-based businesses, By the way, I don't think that'll work with cats. Just probably not. Nope. <laughs> no, I tried to bathe the cat once it went poorly. Yeah. Um, so Service-based businesses, I love. I like them a lot. But the other nice thing about service-based businesses is a lot of times they have a subscription or recurring revenue-based model. And I love that. Love a business where you make a sale one time. And as long as you do a good job and you continue to um, really care for that customer well, you keep getting residual income over and over and over. That's leverage. 
in your favor because you've, you've invested in the sale once with a lot of us in um, who have businesses in some way, shape or form that are physical products. Sometimes one of the things we don't do well, not always, some do better than others, but one of the things sometimes we don't do well is we don't look beyond the single transactional value of that customer over a lifetime. So I want to sell you, um, you know, this tchotchke. So this is part of a little wooden puzzle and I want to sell you one. I really shouldn't. What I really should want to do is I want to, I should want to sell you one of these and get to understand you, how you interacted with it, what you like about it, and then build a relationship where I sell you more things that you also would like over time. In a service-based business, that's very natural to think that way because you want to have folks that come back over and over and over again, because the lifetime value of that customer to your business is higher. And there are a lot of business owners, folks that right now, do not think that way. And you know a business owner that doesn't think that way very simply by looking at their Facebook and their Google reviews. One of the things that I've immediately see opportunity in is if I see a business has been around for a while and I know they've got some decent revenue, but their customer reviews, service-based business are bad. And maybe they started off good and you see a trend over two years where they started to dip. There's two things I know if that happened. One, the owner somehow, some way stopped being more involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Two, they have some bad Apple employees and or bad training. 100%. This happened with some, um, with the contractor, an electrician. I think he was great. Re you know, people recommended him, but the bad thing mm. was he doesn't return phone calls. Mm. And after meeting him, I find out he's so dang busy yep. that he had to bring his wife into the business now. And he just, because he's just so dang busy. He yep. can't get back to new customers. Yeah. So there could be a lot of, now that, so Barbara and I are going to look at that and think to ourselves from a business perspective, I'm going to guess it drove you insane because it would have driven me insane because I immediately would have said, buddy, don't you understand? You could double your business if we just make a couple small tweaks and bring in a, heck, we could bring in a part-time customer service VA who's US based to handle these phone calls for you. And you could just never have to talk to a customer again, except for an estimate and double. So Barbara and I are going to go insane talking to someone like that because this is a, what I would call is, and this is happens all the time. It's a subject matter expert who is not natively a business person. Yeah. I love to bought, do If you bought um, a bunch of related services, like uh, mm -hmm. back to your um, retirement community, let's say you bought a landscaping company, a pool company, and a pet sitting company. Now you have a portfolio of assets all targeting the same demographic that you can sell for multiple more than just having what you bought for each individual. Okay. So you just you just hit on um, my absolute favorite strategy. That's a roll up. That's a, a traditional roll up. So what you're doing is you're rolling up. Um, sometimes they're like businesses, so you can consolidate a market. So let's say you have, well, let's just stay with our, um, our pet scenario. Let's say you've got um, four kind of primary competitors in a space who are providing pet grooming. Maybe they have some mobile, maybe they have some DIY, because that's a big thing right now where you walk in and there's just bays that are fully sort of um, stocked and you can just go and clean like your own pet. Wash. That's exactly what it is for really pets. Cool they had like conveyor belts, you just put your dog on it. it goes yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. I mean, we have those in our, in our neighborhood. So you have um, those, then you have some that are, I would call are, or sort of the boutique uh, grooming slash more gourmet pet food and treat places. So they're all kind of doing the same thing. They're just doing it in a little bit of a different way. So what I would look at is, and this happens sometimes where you, you find out who the owners are of all of them and you do some due diligence and it takes a little time. But what you might find out is three of them are within five years of wanting to exit or retire. And generally if somebody's at that point where they know in the next five years, they're kind of wanting to move, you could probably convince them to do it sooner rather than later. Because once that seed starts to creep into your head as a business owner and you start to look towards the exit, it really, all I need is a crack yeah. to be able to get in and make a deal with you. And so if I can do that with three, then human nature starts to kick in and something interesting happens. If I roll up two or three of them, what I can do is I can leverage the fourth one and say, listen, I'm about to buy all three of these. I would very much love to add your asset to it. And you can either, you know, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. If they don't want to leave the business, you could say, hey, maybe you're only 36 and you love what you're doing. And I see that you're great at it. How about you sell me your business? I'll I'll give you a percentage of ownership equal to what the value of yours was. And I'll bring you in as my general manager. There's a million ways you can do it. But to Barbara's point, if I take four separate businesses that were in that space, and let's say one of them was doing a million bucks a year, which would be actually really good for a grooming business. But one of them is doing a million bucks. One of them is doing 250, maybe one's doing five and one's doing another 250. So that's $2 million right there in gross revenue. Well, the interesting thing is, 
any one of those by itself is probably going to sell for anywhere from a 1.7 to a 2.5, maybe three multiple of the net earnings because of the size. But when you put them together, something magical happens. You put them together, you run them for a little while, you put some efficiencies in, you eliminate waste, and you eliminate redundancy. So you've consolidated a market. Now that same business is going to sell for a significantly higher multiple, four or five, maybe six times. And all you've really done is the work for the next person who's going to buy it, who didn't want to do that work. Because there's a bunch of what I would call small sort of pseudo hedge funds that are family owned that just have a bunch of money and they want to acquire these businesses. They don't really want to do the in the ground, in the dirt work to put the, the nuts and bolts together. They just want it done. They want to buy something that's revenue producing, predictable, kind of runs itself. That's it. So if you're willing to do that work for them, and this is, there are folks that specialize in every industry that do this, that are investors. They, some folks that want healthcare, some folks that want restaurant, believe it or not. That's not a space that I like, but some folks do. Um, some folks don't care. Some folks a little bit more like me. If, if it's profitable and I can understand it and I can do it, then, then we'll buy it. So if you're willing to do some of that grunt work um, and consolidate a market, it doesn't have to be four. It can be two. You could put two competitors together. And I'm telling you, if you put two competitors together, their value combined is going to be significantly better than the value would have been alone. Now, I do want to touch on before we... Um, well, the, the digital... And, Digital. Yeah, I want to touch on digital versus digital. Yeah. So digital. Um, and a lot of times, remember, folks, a lot of times these are it's not like one or the other. A lot of times there's all of these things in one business, especially this day and age. Most businesses don't have digital. If they don't, I'm almost certain that's going to be an amazing opportunity because how easy is it to simply add it? But Digital is a different one. So when I think digital, pure digital, what I'm thinking of is uh, obviously software. I'm thinking yes, of yeah. Yeah, a lot of software service, SAAS software as a service. I'm thinking of um, virtual assistant type stuff. So to me, digital is also um, a digital advertising agency. It's um, an Amazon, um, full service Amazon firm that you hire them and they will handle almost all of your Amazon backend functions, right? That's another example of that. Uh, app developers, um, folks who take uh, automation type folks who will take something that's done repetitively time time and time and time again. I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a friend who just launched one um, for people who have Facebook groups. And what it is, it's just a Chrome extension. The Chrome extension, the most repetitive thing that people do when it comes to groups is if you go to join a group, those of you who are group owners know this, it, it, it can be a little bit time consuming as you grow and get larger to just handle the membership requests and all the things, especially if you're building a list from that, if you're putting emails in, or if you're answering questions or whatever, moderation, et cetera. So all this guy did was he created a, a, a Chrome extension that would directly integrate with a CRM system and put the two together so that all you have to do is click a button and you preset information and anybody that meets those pre-specified commands automatically gets added to the group. You don't have to do it. It just does it for you. So that would be, that. yeah, I, it's phenomenal. I, I actually, if you, if you want, I can get you it for free. Uh, just Message remind me, you. please. Thank you. Um, Darn new he's, group. Yeah, he's beta testing. So ultimately, digital assets are really anything that doesn't have a physical presence. They can be good. Here's the caveat. You got to know what you're doing. Know what digital, you're doing. digital may be a little bit more than some other things. Now, you can probably tell by talking to me, I'm a generalist. I would not be afraid to jump into a digital asset because I know how to lead other people well. So the first thing I would do is if I wanted to go and buy, um, you know, a, a subscription-based software program is I would try to figure out who the most knowledgeable person I could find was. Maybe someone who had run a company before and exited it, took some time off or whatever, or maybe never owned their own company, but worked for other people. And I would try to figure out how to give that person a piece of my deal to come in and run it for me. Because I would know that when it gets into the weeds and software, I don't know how to code. Wow. So if there's a, if there's a problem, I wouldn't necessarily know how to solve it. But what I do love about digital, the margins are massive. Right. Massive because you don't really have any overhead. So um, I'll give you an example that everybody here probably has heard of. Helium 10 is a great example. Helium 10 is in the, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Helium 10 is in the middle of the buyout right now. They have been for multiple years. And with a company of that size, you're really talking about institutional investors, hedge fund money. When a hedge fund comes in and they buy a company of that size, there's a lot of, uh, how do I say this? There are a lot of sort of things that they're going to demand happen. 
some people that are going to leave the business, some people that they want to stay. Um, if there's someone, and this is a huge problem with a lot of businesses um, in any space, but if it's what I would call a cult of personality, right? So I'll give you an example. Name of your primary business is, is Deal Divas, Barbara? Deal Diva? Um, that's one of my... One of them. Again. <laughs> so let's say I would just, just as an, to, to illustrate a point. If you decided to sell that business, I couldn't. you're going to me. Bingo. So there are a lot of businesses that people with the best of intentions. Well, because if you they, go to um, like um, Victory Slippers, we just launched that site a couple days ago because I had 800 USA flag slippers and we rebranded mm, them instead yep. of uh, for the election. We rebranded them as people work at home stay together they only have the u.s flag on it we can get through this together rah rah and mm -hmm. it's just one slipper so i could potentially sell off build that out with other slippers and sell yeah. that slipper because off. it isn't you so let me, let me so let me go back to helium 10 for a second because everybody's seen this happen in real time they may just not have realized what they were seeing anybody seen manny coats on anything recently no you haven't no. Do you know why because when the institutional investor, and the same thing I would have said, when the institutional investor went to look at that business and vet it, the first thing they realized was this is a guy that's on every single podcast. He goes to every single event. Everybody knows him. He's on every single AMA that they do. He is, in right now, he is very much the business. So if we were to exit and cut a cord, we're going to have an enormous problem because a lot of people are expecting Manny to be there all the time. So what do you do in that situation? You create what is called a succession plan, a contingency plan. You begin to slowly move that person out of the primary operations role. They're almost always, and I'm sure Manny is, they're almost always still there running things, but they're slowly beginning to release control of it. And really importantly for big companies where there's a lot of zeros on the end of it, but it's also true of small businesses. Uh, if you have a small business in a town and the person who owned the business is beloved in the community, that's a watch out. It's not a no, it's just a watch out. You need that person to be willing to stay and warm hand off you the operations, the goodwill, the relationships. So that's what's happening with Helium 10. And that's why you're seeing Bradley on everything and not Manny, because there was enormous problem with Manny being synonymous with Helium 10. And much like um, Alex and uh, Tactical Arbitrage, I suspect he would have the same kind of issue. Well, and they just had it with uh, uh, Viral Launch. Casey's gone. I mean, everybody thought, wow. everybody thought of Casey when they thought of Viral Launch. And Casey, so that was acquired by um, a venture capital firm. And they didn't like where some of the, uh, the numbers were going, as I understand it. And here's the tricky thing with software. And this is a great case study. So... You have to really understand with digital products, is there a temporary situation that is allowed for significant growth? Because in software, especially, that happens a lot. And with Viral Launch, Helium 10, Scope, everybody remember Scope? Yeah. Um, uh, Jungle Scout, et cetera. For a while, a lot of these developers had backend access to Amazon's API and, and their data, candidly. Well, what was it? Eight months ago now? That discontinued. That's right. So, Really, what everybody has now is a guess, just a guess. That's what it is. So none are really better than the other. And because of that, um, Viral Launch in particular, not only did, was their data no longer better than, I, I would argue that Viral Launch's visual experience was better than anybody. They did a great job. But not only did their data suddenly become not as good as any, really the same as everybody else's, the other problem was their entire platform was built upon a strategy that stopped working overnight minute yeah didn't work and so right, because let's strategy, get into the weeds of the specific services uh sure. they all have a place and i don't want to you know call anybody out or upset anybody so <laughs> let's back yeah out. so if you guys want to have i would say um barbara is always very diplomatic i appreciate that about her i you can follow me i'm very direct I find you and there's a couple of questions here i want them to uh, oh yeah to answer too but um, how can people find you? First of all, I've dropped the new Facebook group that I created about a half an hour before this. Um, it's called uh, Sell a Business, Buy a Business, Business Acquisition Opportunities, because I, I needed to answer the question for myself. Where do I find businesses to sell? And in fact, yep. somebody Here. asked that question. So I took the bull by the horns. I created a Facebook.com slash groups slash sell by biz. And um, it's just for people to, and I've, I'm vetting it. Like you, you can post in there, but I'm going to have to approve the post, right? So there's not going to be any spam in there. It's just, Hey, I have something I need to sell for whatever reason. Here it is. Or I have something I want to buy. Here it is. And uh, you can do that in this group. I just put a few in the comments. I will tell you. Oh, cool. Thanks. 
two of them um, are generalist. So biz by cell is the biggest one. In the comments, because the people who see the replay won't see the comments. I'm going to yeah, put pull those out of there. Group. Okay. So, so biz by cell is the biggest one. They're the, they're the behemoth B I Z B U Y S E L L. And it's a lot like some of the other software programs that maybe you're used to. If you're selling uh, digital, you can, you can manipulate searches. You can look for almost anything you want. You can put parameters in there for the cash flow, for the size of the business, the type of the business, the industry, everything you can imagine, the state, the location. I use that a lot. So I spend a lot of time in uh, biz buy sell website closers is another one. That one special specializes more to Barbara's point in digital type products. Um, so e-commerce brands you'll find on there, Amazon business, businesses, Shopify businesses, um, and then just more traditional econ businesses that are not on any of those platforms. And then BizQuest is a little bit like Biz Buy Sell. It's just um, smaller. And a lot of times the same listings will be on this, you know, the two different platforms. So think of these, if you would, if you're familiar with real estate, like MLS, that's sort of what these are. These are sort of the MLS for um, businesses. Um, it, the other question you ask, and there's, I see a couple questions in here. If you want to find me- well, Before you move on from that, I'm sorry. My concern, and I love the real estate analogy because I'm a real estate investor. Mm. Is, um, I like finding the properties before they go on the MLS. Yeah. Right? That's so a, once they're on one of these platforms, they're blasting out to their email list. I like right. the distressed assets on my own, which is one of the reasons I created this group, right? Yep. Before they ever make it to the public market. So to do that, um, actually the strategy is very similar. So what do you do? How do you do that in real estate? You, you get lists you send out mailers, you knock on doors, you meet as many people as you can and you tell as many people as you can what you do and what you're interested in. Local chambers of commerce, um, local networking, business networking meetings. I'm trying to think of one of the groups that's a common, um, BNI. BNI is a group that a lot of folks network their businesses in. All of those are great opportunities to go and just start to sort of understand what's available. Not as great, I will say, um, if you're looking specifically to acquire uh, a software or digital business, because a lot of those businesses don't belong to a chamber of commerce, but yeah. some do. Um, the other thing you can do that I'm starting to do is start to look on Amazon for um, brands that are distressed. And it's yes. not difficult to figure that out. So if you start to see trends where brands are distressed, now here's where you need to be careful and you need to make a judgment call yourself. You are not supposed to respond to people or engage with folks through the buy or sell platform, right. but you can. So the other thing I, I would say, look, I wouldn't even do that. I would just go to LinkedIn. I would find the contact information for that. Platform. You can find them on LinkedIn. You can also find a lot of information just with Google. So if you just, if you can figure out the name of their product and you Google search it, um, Facebook too, because what a lot of uh, brand owners will do for whatever reason is they won't have a LinkedIn profile, but they'll have the name of the business or the brand that they own somewhere on their Facebook profile. Right. So you can find it there too. So um, due diligence, this is not sexy. This is not, this is the part that's just, it's just gut work. It just takes time to go in there and dig and sift. And it's almost like if you've ever gone to a, um, a, a thrift store, a thrift store, or like a big uh, auction. You said you like auctions, Barbara. It, you got to pick through a lot of stuff to get to something that looks amazing. Same thing when you're looking for businesses. The other strategy is, so that's one strategy. So if I went to a, a storage auction, I don't yep. buy the entire storage unit. I let other guys bid it up, buy it, but I know there's one piece in there I want. Mm. And I'll go to the guy who bought it and I'll cherry pick that piece out. I'll say, give me this. I'll take it off your hands right now. But then the go. opposite side is uh, I call it my shock and awe. So I'll buy trailers of stuff. Yeah. I might not know everything that's in there, but I know if I can get the right price for a trailer of Amazon returns or finger hot returns, which I've actually done is finger hot returns is um, if I get it at the, a great price, there's more risk involved, but uh, I have a much higher, um, I, I can, I can profit from that. Yeah. So there's the buy it all. And that's also a strategy I use with my suppliers. I'll ask the question. And in fact, uh, one of them is even trained. He asks me first. It's kind of funny. It's a joke between us. Um, what's the best price you can give me when I buy it all or if mm -hmm. I buy it all. Yep. And um, buying it all means there's no competition that can buy that product because I own it all. Right. Mm -hmm. But I always make sure I have two or three ways to sell it if I'm going to buy it all. But then yes. a great price on it. Have an exit strategy. Always Definitely have an exit, have an exit strategy. strategy. I make money on the buy. Yep, that's it. Absolutely. Um, actually, Bob, this is a better question for you. Barbara, this is a better question for you. Where do you find trailer and container sales? Is there a website? I actually don't do a lot of that. It, sometimes they come friend, to me. Tracy, you know you're going to hear me say this a lot. Also go to um, 
liquidation.com, but I focus on the Amazon stuff, but I'd say mm. start small. If you've not done this and you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the staff, unless you're going to flip that trailer, start small and just buy a Gaylord, buy a pallet. Here's the opposite side of that. The way that returns are taken, let's just use Amazon. They don't palletize them. They stuff it into a truck, and you <laughs> yeah. a Tetris thing, but everything is tightly packed. And you open that truck and it's boxes. So if you're buying a pallet of Amazon returns, that means somebody has bought that trailer, potentially cherry picked all the good stuff off and then palletized what was left. Yeah, so that's not manifested. Yep, you're right. So just be careful when you're doing the stuff that you educate yourself on liquidation. There's definitely yep. money in it. Oh, absolutely. Huge money. Well, and I'll, so I'm going to give you a local example of a lady who's up to, I believe, 2 million bucks a year. I won't tell you the name of her business, but she started buying liquidation lots and selling them to e-com sellers. That was a bad business for her because there was just, you just said it, there was a lot of junk that she had to sort through and it became time too time consuming and about 80% of it, nobody wanted to buy. Right. So she figured something and I told her this before she did it and she, to her credit, she figured it out. The one thing that was the most profitable for her is she started, they, so they had a big back end that was just warehouse and they had a little small storefront, just the nature of the building that they leased. And they were buying from um, overstock.com and Wayfair and they started getting in furniture that they figured out there was really nothing wrong with it. It was just maybe the box was beat up or whatever and it had to be put together. So they started putting it together and then they started putting it almost in a little small showroom in the front of their building and they stuck it on Facebook marketplace um, offer up and some others that grew so fast that every day people cleaned them out mostly who was cleaning them out were real estate agents stagers and designers some public but every day they cleaned out so the space that she was using to put up the uh, furniture just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the other stuff she was buying kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller and now the only thing she does is she ended up getting a space that's exclusive it's just a huge the whole thing's a showroom she buys um, from Target, she buys from Wayfair, she buys from Overstock, and they put the furniture together and they sell it to the public and she kills. That's how I started in physical products was uh, after the, the crash, the real estate crash, I needed to physically touch stuff. It was very good. Yeah. And I started buying furniture at auctions and then th that grew and I bought like, a, there's a store here locally in Phoenix, it was called Nobody Beats Mitch. And it was this huge <laughs> furniture store and somebody beat Mitch. Um, Mitch decided he wanted to get out, right? Mitch Poor is Mitch. in my neighborhood. He was exhausted all the time. He's an yeah. introvert. He's like, I'm done. And he would do these like funky uh, late night commercials with him as a cartoon going, nobody beats Mitch, right? So somebody beat Mitch. They did an auction. I bought out beds. I mean, I bought six giant storage units full and multiple trucks they had to bring from the auction a couple of days later. Unloaded these beds. Um, it's like trundle beds and bunk yeah. beds and crazy. But what I did was I also had a source for wholesale bed sheets. Oh, nice. and I bought these Leggett and Platt, which is this really high end bed frames, just mm. the frames, right? The but metal. Yeah. Nobody wanted them. The metal frame. Nobody wanted them. I was buying for like 10 bucks a lot, but they were like 30 in each lot. Wow. It, it was crazy. And nobody's bidding against me. So at some point, at one point, the auctioneer, we're going through all these lots. He would just call my number and say, four, four, five, five, four, 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 five, five. I didn't even get that. He's like, you're taking them all, Barbara, right? So I put that next to rolling racks of the bed sheets in every storage unit with all the beds. Holy Christmas. Did I, mm. that was like the best I bought out of the furniture. It was the best ever. That's awesome. That's a great one. I love that wonderful. story. And, but that led to my, um, my, my bedding brand, which yeah. led me to Amazon. This was mm -hmm. the Amazon days, right? This is back in, 2013, 2012, whatever. So well, you were nimble. Space, right? You were, you were, you were nimble and you were open to what business opportunities may come. And that's it guys. That's the, that's really the secret. It's not any more than just being willing to be nimble, solve your way through problems. And, and right now, especially perhaps more than any time in my life, if you can remain calm, and you can think clearly and you can be willing to take some calculated risks in, in a few swings, you can, you can really do well for yourself. I want to answer Greg. Yes, I am from Maine. Um, I see that you're in Fort Kent, which Barbara Fort Kent is almost Canada. Um, and I have a very, very good friend who's here now that I bet, you know, who used to be, I won't say his name, but he used to be the women's soccer coach at UMFK and he's now down here. So I have a feeling, you know, who I'm talking about, but yes, I'm from Bucksport, Maine, which I, I think you probably know where that is as well. 
So Tracy's asking for one website. Tracy, remember, Google is your friend. I'm going to encourage you not just go to one website that we mentioned here, but Google trailer retail trailer trailer loads. Okay? There's also, um, have you ever done anything with B stock, Barbara? I didn't, but I know some people have. I was thinking about selling some stuff on B stock. On B stock, yeah. That seems to be where the pick through stuff goes. So just warning to you folks. It doesn't mean you can't find anything, but I think usually savvy folks like Barbara, they buy a lot and then they sell what they don't want on there. Yeah, smell, sell smaller lots on there. So just I do want to mention, um, and Barbara, I think you're going to be a guest on this show. I'm starting a series, and this is very much out of a heart to help us to connect as business owners. Please. Because the greatest strength I think that we really have, and the thing I enjoy the most is I love talking to people who own different kinds of businesses. It doesn't really matter to me what kind of business it is because I'm just, I'm naturally curious. So I am starting a series. I have a web page up that's TREP, T-R-E-P, across America, um, not a web page, a Facebook page. There's also a YouTube page and I'll be putting interviews with entrepreneurs and business owners from all over the country of all different types. So I'll have folks who are um, second generation brick masons who have sort of a brick masonry business. I'll have folks in digital commerce, obviously. I'll have folks who own factories, folks who do service-based and just try to draw out of some of those folks what works? What's working right now? What's not working? We should um, talk auctions. You, yeah, I love that. I would like to learn more about, about auctions. auctions. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to learn more about auctions because I'm a, I'm a born deal hunter. So, Greg, you'll know this. Everybody, I think, from Maine grew up. Uh, you have to be resourceful. So, all of us are deal hunters. We call it. This is a word that's going to make you laugh if you've never heard it, Barbara. But in Maine, the art of negotiating a deal is called dickering. Dickering. So that's a that's a Mainism. Really, I remember that word. Okay, I didn't know you were from Dickerer. That's how I got. Yeah, a little little dickering. Is I dicker? But yeah, you guys can find it there. Barbara will be on there. I'll have some other folks. That's going to go live soon. Um, and then Trep Across America is the Facebook page. We'd love to have you. It costs nothing. It's just I think Barbara and I share a heart here, and it's where we we connected pretty easily. Is this is a tough time for folks, but it's also a time where if we lead well and we keep our we keep our wits about us and we just focus on the opportunities and laser focus in on what we're doing, you can come through this thriving and doing really, really well. So we just want to try to, you know, offer up resources and information to the community that helps people to do that. I'm working on pretty big liquidation deals now of new product SKUs that uh, their vendors, their brand owners that are going out of business. And I'm working mm -hmm. on buying up their assets and reselling them to e-commerce sellers. I'm not Love even selling on Amazon. I'm just going to flip the stuff to other e-commerce sellers. I'm getting a great press. I'll make, I'll make that spread and help yeah. e-commerce sellers get product and then yep. sell it on multiple. So I'm, I'm working on that right now. I've got a couple of deals in the works. I'll let you guys know when I, um, I've got products. Um. Well, think about one more thing. One more last tip for those of you who have ever, look, China's controversial right now. I'll be the first to admit it. I've been to China many times. I've taken people to China. China is what it is, but I will say this, just to be transparent, there's gonna be some phenomenal opportunities to source products from China at, incredible deals either the actual cost you pay or the other thing that could be happening that did not happen before with china is the opportunity to negotiate terms that you didn't have the opportunity to do before because think about all these factories whose end sellers have gone out of business or don't have any capital in the u.s but they've They're, given them 30 percent down on the products that's now that's still sitting at the factory sitting there and they got to do something with these because they don't want it so there will be i just had a conversation with a friend who's a contact over there and i bought a container load for so i took so take your background and what you know to your point barbara and then try to see if you can match it with an opportunity i took my background in the surgical field i spent six years going just operating rooms all across the country and helping them to be more efficient, better run, et cetera. Well, one of the things you learn a lot about in an operating room is sterility and pathogens. So I know quite a bit about that. So I knew this was going to get bad before some other folks did, because I know where these types of things tend to go. I also know there's a way to sterilize things that hospitals have been doing for years that the consumer isn't quite aware of yet. So um, I don't want to share exactly what it is, but what I did don't was I, it yet. Don't trouble no, I, I reached out to a friend, and said, listen, can you source this for me? Does it even exist? And it took him three hours to find a factory. And he said, yeah, not only does it exist, they have a bunch of stock they're sitting on that somebody ordered and couldn't pay for. <laughs> I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> and so there, there's an opportunity to add all these things. Things are still shipping, guys. It's just taking longer. And candidly, it's going to it's gonna cost you more money to ship things right now. But that doesn't mean that there's not opportunity. And it'll hit it'll hit the U.S. ports and sit for a bit because um, everybody's home, so they don't have the workers to process Absolutely. it. 
And uh, JB, I'd definitely like to talk to you about that sourcing agent, that lead, because uh, I want some renewable sure. energy stuff. You got it. Off the grid product. So uh, good idea. Good idea. So if you could, we'll talk about that after. Yeah. See, guys, look at this. This was unscripted. All right. Yeah. I have a little blurb of introduce JB and let him go. So this was completely unscripted. And look at all of the, the ideas we generated in just a short time. So please um, follow JB, uh, join TREP across America in his Facebook group. I'm also going to uh, pop a link to him, his contact information, all the links that we have in the chat here in um, my new gr group called Business Acquisition Opportunities, BAO. Mm -hmm. Go to facebook.com slash group slash sell by biz. And I'll, I'll join that too. I think she invited me. I think she just made it this morning. She's so I'm industrious. So I'll jump in there. And if you put a question in there and, and if you want me to answer it specifically, just tag me and I'll at, pop in there and answer yeah, it. Yeah, do at JB. And it's JB Brown, folks. Thank you so much, JB. You got it, Barbara. Thank you. Being here, this is the first time we've actually done anything together. So this was really cool and a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very informative. You're welcome. Thank you. Again, J.B. Brown, I'm Barbara Drazga, and we just had a great chat about business buying strategies. So much more to cover. Uh, people who have questions for J.B., please put it in the Facebook Live chat, put it in the group, and we will get him to answer those for you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great have a night. Week, guys. Bye.